I'm sure our next guest will give you plenty to tweet about as we once again put research in focus as we explore smart wireless for smart devices. So do you remember the days when your mobile phone was just that, a phone? When you weren't constantly connected to your friends and colleagues through the text messaging and social media? When you looked up a restaurant using a telephone book? Well, if you do, you're older than me. But seriously, the proliferation of mobile devices and more advanced applications have connected us in ways we couldn't have imagined a generation ago. And in the process, we've pushed the demand for wireless spectrum to its limits, necessitating the development of new concepts in wireless network design that can better handle the increased traffic. At the same time, we're seeing a host of new mobile applications and new ways of interacting with users. Which brings us to the topic we'll be exploring with our next guests. How can smart wireless help smart devices? Here to help sort it all out are Aaron Venkataramani, Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Bozadir Rudonovich, a researcher at Microsoft Research. Welcome, guys. Um, Aaron, can I start with you? Can you tell me what's going on in the area of architecture for mobile devices? We're working on a next generation or future internet architecture for mobile devices with mobility or seamless support for mobility and security as the guiding design principles. Both of these concerns were kind of left out of the, 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 the original design process for the current internet, and we're trying to fix that. So you're, you're obviously you're trying to fix that, and how essentially are you going to start from scratch, or are there, what's going to happen? So this is a process called a clean slate design process. It's, uh, it's more a way of thinking than actually enforcing the process itself. It's asking the question, if we could take a step back and start from scratch on what would be a mobile-friendly, secure internet, how would we do that? With the end goal not necessarily being to uproot what's out there and replace it, but allow us to just have the thought process be unencumbered by concerns of backwards compatibility. So it's a, it's a creative thought process. And so what are the problems then? How are you going to address them with your clean slate design? So seamless mobility and security are the two problems. So let me explain what this means. Security, when the, the original internet was designed, they just had no idea that it would become so big and so successful yeah. as it has right now. Like we depend on, on the internet for everything from commerce to education to, to healthcare and whatnot. Mobility, back in the days, people moving and changing networks like Wi-Fi and cellular, this was not expected, this was not common. So they assumed that devices would be at one network attachment point at any given time and would just stay there for long periods of time. This is no longer the case. And to th therefore, the solutions that they have to work around to give us a semblance of seamless mobility are kludgy and, and broken and fragile. And we're trying to fix both of these problems through a clean slate design process. Um, and so this, uh, this manifests itself into a current architecture in terms of you know, malicious activity. Could you explain a bit? Right. So in the current internet, because security was left out of the design process, some really bad things can happen with very little effort. So for example, even a single benignly misconfigured router on the internet can bring down huge portions of the internet for hours or like half a day or so on. And this, this, this has happened multiple times. It happens every now and then, even now. So you just have to imagine what would happen if, it, if somebody was maliciously using a router somewhere in an ISP in a country that's not necessarily friendly to, to your people. Um, this, is not, this is not a problem just limited to, to routers. This is a problem that's, that affects services out there, web services, end clients, mobile systems. Another example is some time back, an ISP in Pakistan unintentionally hijacked YouTube because their censorship laws are different from those in Western countries. And they wanted to place limits on what content was accessible to their people. And neighboring ISPs just happily adopted those filters, even though that wasn't the intended goal. This is because there is really very little security in the networking fabric of the current internet. And so how would you go around fixing this? Couldn't you just <coughs> fix it in, in, in smaller chunks, or would it have to be a whole design? Right. So an important concern is incremental deployability. For the, success, for the success of any effort like this, it's important to make sure that our solution does not depend on everyone adopting it all at the same time. So we are working on solutions that would give incremental benefits to pockets of networks as they adopt it. 
And the approach to, to fix some of these security issues is to ensure, is, is in the design process, ask the question at every layer of the protocol stack, um, as we describe the internet, what would happen if one or a small fraction of entities were malicious? And then look at what all they can do and try to derive provably correct properties for correct operation of the network despite the presence of those malicious entities. This was not done with the current internet. And um, what about mobility problems with right. the current internet? So we, you might all think that you know we have mobile devices today. The internet just works fine. So why is the internet not already mobility friendly? So I'll give you an example that maybe even lay people can appreciate. You've probably been in a situation where you're downloading a file on the web or using some other tool. You're at home. You want to go to work. It's taking long to download, and you have to make a call. Should I kill this download here and go to work and restart it, or should I let it complete for however long it threatens or, or predicts it'll take? Um, this is now. If this were the only problem, there's you know, most minimally tech savvy people can find their way around it. Many tools already fix this problem, but this is the same problem for which YouTube, Amazon Video, Netflix Video spend redundant software engineering effort to develop fragile workarounds at the application layer because the underlying network does not provide seamless, clean support for mobility. Uh, but why should I be concerned if, if the workarounds are working for you know, YouTube and Netflix? Uh, what's the problem? Right, so that's a very good question. Um, it comes down to cost, fragility, or the robustness of a solution. Um, just about everything that you want to do on top of the current internet if you can think it, there is a way to do it. It's a matter of how much it costs you, how much redundancy there is. Netflix, YouTube, and Amazon Video are not the only three players. There's, there's thousands of other smaller players which also are doing the same thing. Every messaging app, Viber, or Vonage, or Skype, and WhatsApp, and, and they, ha they have to provide the same kind of application level support that they would not have to if the underlying network did it for them. And how does the domain name service impact mobility? Right. So the internet has something called DNS. That's like the internet's telephone directory. That's what translates names like www.amazon.com to an IP address. This was designed back in the 80s when mobility was not changing IP addresses or mobility at, at the network level was not a common phenomenon. Now that mobility is common, this DNS that was designed with either static names to IP address mappings or ones that change in the order of days or weeks. This has to be fixed. We want lightning fast updates where I'm changing, I'm going from Wi-Fi to cellular, I'm changing networks while being on, on, a, on, a, on a data session. And I want this DNS, this next generation DNS that we call GNS or Global Name Service to on the fly rapidly, near instantaneously handle these updates. And what would this Global Name Service do? This global name service will provide instantaneous IP address locations of devices. So the important thing here is that it'll help you find where a device is right now so that you can communicate with it. But if that device changes its network address while your session is in progress, it could be a voice over IP call, it could be a data transfer, it would still seamlessly work underneath the covers because the endpoint protocol stack would go back to the GNS, <coughs> update the current location, and resume the connection. In fact, what we can do is if two nodes, two endpoints simultaneously move, change network attachment points, even then we can near seamlessly, it is in a manner that's hardly perceptible to human beings, restore the connectivity between these two devices. Um, and just going a little bit deeper into uh, explaining how GNS works, how is, how is that going to solve security problems and, right. and you know, what's available to us? Right. So the key thing that makes this GNS tick um, and that solves actually both the mobility problem and the security problem, the two birds with one stone, is that we, we have an endpoint identification scheme that does not rely on an IP address to identify endpoints. In today's internet, today's internet suffers from what's called the identity location conflation problem. An IP address is used both to, both to identify a device and to identify the network location of the device. This causes a problem under mobility because the identity is the same, but the network location is changing. We separate the identity from the IP address, which is only used for the network location. The identity is a secure public key. So the key abstraction in this new architecture is the ability to send a message 
to a cryptographic public key that cannot be spoofed or hijacked like an IP address can be today. So th what are the consequences of this, this kind of unidirectional communication, the fact that all communication has to be initiated from the mobile device? So in today's internet, there is this limitation. It's a handicap that all communication has to be initiated from the mobile device. You might think that you have bi-directional connectivity from mobile devices, which is true, you, you do, but all communication is initiated from the device. A server from outside, from the internet, cannot co establish first contact with a mobile device. <coughs> this is because of a number of reasons. Some of them are, are mundane, some of them are more fundamental. In Mobility First, this new architecture that's, that uses this global name service, it, 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 it does not have this handicap. In fact, it preserves the Internet's open any-to-any -any communication model. Any device can communicate with any other device freely. And without how close are you to achieving Mobility First? Really Great question. So we've been working on this project. We're in the fifth year of this project oh, and the really? second phase of this NSF-funded project. And we built most of the important components of the protocol stack, the endpoint component, the router component, and of course the most important GNS, that's like the heartbeat yeah. of this whole system. And we're actually gearing up towards a major release this summer to the, the, the scientific community as well as industry <coughs> practitioners, providing them application development toolkits to start playing with this and start building new apps that are interoperable with the current internet, but use this new technology with all of its benefits. Thank you, Aaron. It's fascinating. Bozano, you've been Thank sitting you. there waiting patiently. Um, let's talk about your current work on um, fixing wireless transmission problems. Um, I have a Wi-Fi at home. You know, sometimes I have problems with it. Can you explain <coughs> what might be causing this? So, uh, in sort of apartment setting where lots of your neighbours also have Wi-Fi access points, they'll be running them probably out of the box, sitting on a... So there are a few Wi-Fi channels that are available. The access point will be on probably the channel it was set up by a manufacturer, which might possibly happen to be the same channel for everyone in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and you will all be using the same channel clashing with each other interfering. And so you know uh, <coughs> aren't there any features that can coordinate the channels I'm using with everybody else in the neighbor? Well the, you could definitely do that the problem is how do you persuade all your neighbors to participate to that kind of uh, uh, the coordination game. Um, Okay, so what, what, what can we do? You know, do, I, do we need lots of frequencies? Do we need to, you know, there are ongoing changes. If I'm in a, in a big area, how do we solve that? So the number of frequencies is somewhat limited with, um, so the you know, regulators around the world give you a set of frequencies that are used for Wi-Fi. Certainly, it will be great to have more and they're working on that, but if we're, for the moment, we're limited with a set of frequencies and then it will be definitely great to have a coordination protocol that will manage to at least uh, use the available resources as, as good as possible. And I understand you're working on an algorithm. Yes, so, so we are working on an algorithm that is supposed to do that in a way that would be feasible with the current uh, sort of constraints, which means that you don't want to have to assemble all your neighbors and discuss where to put yeah. your channel. You want the sort of the hardware to do that and the software yeah. to do it for you. And so it has to be a very simple algorithm that anyone, everyone can run on its own. And if some, you know, some neighbors choose not to do that, well, still, you know, everything should work smooth and should improve your performance. Have, in, have you implemented this outside of the lab? <coughs> you know, is it something the neighbours and I could start using now? Or? Yes, I think, uh, so we have a c couple of deployments and uh, we've tested them, <coughs> we've tested them so far, uh, mainly in the lab. And uh, we also tested some other interesting scenarios, but uh, I guess we're hoping now to take it out and, uh, you know, have more people try it. And so how is it actually going to work in, a, <coughs> or will it work in a large geographical area, you know, the downtown <coughs> of a city or a large park? So that's, a, that's another interesting direction, which is basically uh, you can think of all, all, most of the Wi-Fi uh, access points, uh, currently all the Wi-Fi access points work on these uh, bands for defined for what they call ISM bands, which have a problem that they don't propagate that far. So if you go out of your house, most likely you won't be able to hear your access point down the road. And so the nice thing which happened, which happened recently was that some of these digital switchover when the digital TVs were, uh, analog TVs were moved to digital, they kind of uh, freed some of the frequencies in the lower spectrum, so, so UHF spectrum, VHF spectrum, which are very interesting for these good propagation um, characteristics. So now there's, an, uh, there's some effort trying to put Wi-Fi in this kind of spectrum. And so uh, there the problem is that there is a curse and blessing of going far, and the, the, the blessing is that you can actually serve more users, and as you walk around the street, you will have your mm. Wi-Fi sort of like signal. 
But the curse is you have a lot more interference. So this kind of algorithm is much more needed then. And how will that? <coughs> how will those frequencies be distributed? Am I, have I got to go to a provider, <coughs> um, you know, who has the right to these unused frequencies? So that will be uh, accessible the same way as you now use Wi-Fi. You don't really do anything. You just buy your your hardware with some software on it, and it's going to work. And it's actually already commercially available in the U.S. and Singapore, and it's coming out in the U.K. Uh, end of this year, beginning of next year. So. Um, could you explain a little bit about uh, you know the Wi-Fi XL? Right. So that's that's our uh, global, I mean, bigger effort to kind of try to understand how to design Wi-Fi for these uh, for these frequencies. And so one of the challenges certainly is that because you have to go far, uh, lots of uh, the physics of underlying signal propagation, everything changes. Um, and so in a nutshell, you basically have to wait longer for signals to come back. And 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 there's lots of lots more of uh, funny interference thing that happened with your neighbors, but here it happened larger scale. So we've done several things in a sort of bigger framework to deal with these things. One of which is this um, this algorithm for changing frequencies to avoid in, to, to avoid interference. And um, and has the Wi-Fi XL been deployed <coughs> anywhere yet? Well, not yet. We only have our own uh, test deployment. So one of the main issues now is that because there's a lot of new stuff there, uh, there's some hardware to be built uh, to make it accessible to users. Our our test hardware is quite expensive. I don't think anyone would want to invest <laughs> in it. But we are we are we're currently there's a lot of industries working on trying to miniaturize that and understand what's the best way to go forward. Well, thank you guys. It sounds like you're promising better wireless connectivity now, so we can enjoy internet experience in a more, I guess, attuned the preferences for smartphones and mobile devices. Now, the two of, the two of you are better delivered because I think quite a few people are relying on it out there.